So hi, Will. We hey. are here at uh, the Teenage Engineering booth. Uh, I've heard that you are the resident teenager in, in the team. For so. a time, yeah. <laughs> Not anymore, but just, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're here to show off a few, few new bits and bobs, mainly the KO2. Uh, we brought our KO2 arcade cabinets uh, to show off, you know, the best of what KO2 can do uh, in quite a sleek package. Uh, so these guys might appear in a store near you soon. Uh, it's a great way of demoing the product. It sounds fantastic, feels fantastic. Uh, it's just a really cool way of showing it off and hearing it. Cool. Um, so, uh, I, you know, it's been out for a few a month or so now, right? Yeah. Um, but we haven't seen it before, so talk us through it. What is it? Sure. So KO2 is our new sampler. Uh, it's the sort of second generation of the PO33 KO. Um, it takes everything we, we did with the PO33 and expands on it times a million, I'd say. You know, obviously the PO33 sounded great, had that real lo-fi charm to it, but it was quite limited in what you could record, how many sounds, how long. Uh, so we just kind of like a thousand X'd everything about the PO33. Um, so obviously you've got these really nice big pads. Uh, they feel really nice. They're uh, based off of Cherry MX switches. Uh, so if I can get one of these off, there you go. As you might get on a keyboard. Um, so they've got that really nice clicky feel to them, uh, but they're quite soft at the same time, low profile switches. Uh, so, you know, you can just kind of hit on them and, and make a beat and it feels just quite satisfying, I think. Uh, so a lot of work went into selecting the right feel for everything. It's designed off of the Lego grid. Um, so everything from the buttons to the size to you know, the distribution of things on the device is all based around that grid. Uh, even stuff such as you know, the, the speaker cover uh, comes off and uses sort of Lego style attachments. Uh, so you can customize your unit with extra Legos on top of that. Uh, so take off the battery cover, install your own stuff over it. You can 3D print bits uh, and stick them on. And that even extends onto the sides, actually. So you've got these nice mounting holes, um, which allow you to build stands. Uh, we've seen some really cool stuff pop up online. Uh, our cases and whatnot um, will potentially interface with these systems. Um, but then, you know, if you want to have uh, a stand or your own case, you can click it onto there. In the arcade machine, for example, we use it to mount the device onto that. So it's a really nice little system to use uh, to click things together. And you know, if you have two of them and a little Lego joint, you can just click them together. And it's a bit like a, a kind of CDJ type setup, but with samplers. It's quite fun. Um, so KO2 is kind of based off of the idea of you know, recording stuff in your environment. If you want to, it's got a mic. Uh, but as well as that, you can use the line in and record off of a turntable or your computer or your phone, um, as you would with any other sampler. Uh, but obviously more on the go. So as you will have seen there, it's quite thin, it's quite light, um, but it's super sturdy. So we spent a lot of time working on making it really solid. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one that we really believe in and we're really excited about. Um, we've had some really great feedback from customers about it. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's KO2. So should we hear, uh, hear a bit of it and see some features? Yeah, absolutely. So the idea with the KO2 is that you get uh, four different groups. Each group holds 12 sounds. So that's what the 12 black pads are, and then the gray pads are your groups. Um, you can populate those pads in the sound menu. You then record in the main menu, and of course you can change tempo here. You then get four function pads. So that's sample, obviously for sampling, which it has a sub pad of chop. So if you see a, a sort of sub print, that's the shift function. So we don't want anything to be hidden behind menus, behind menus, behind menus. Everything that you see, you can get at in one or two key presses. That's kind of the, the gist of the device. Um, so you've got sample, obviously, timing. That's where you can select the sort of quantization within the device, as well as the grid that it uh, records to. So here we've got it set to 1 16th. So you get 16 steps per bar. That's 
you know, as you would in a DAW, but then you can turn that up to 16T or 32, uh, or all the way down to eight. So it's quite versatile in that regard. You can punch stuff in really fast with 1 8 and then go a bit more precise with 132. Uh, you've then got six different effects. So you've got delay, reverb, distortion, chorus, filter, and compressor. Uh, they sound really nice. We worked really hard testing out you know, different algorithms for the effects until they were super nice. Uh, so it's quite a, a lush reverb, quite a funky delay, a really nice chorus, a punchy compressor, and quite a strong distortion. Uh, and then obviously you've got arrays, so that's how you remove stuff that you've recorded. Kind of self-explanatory. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess we can try s sequencing some stuff. So if you hit record, that will arm you to record. You can see the length of the pattern there, LN1. Plus or minus will change that length, so we can set it to two bar length. If you hit play now, it'll give you a four beat count in. So obviously you could hear there my timing wasn't great, but it's got built-in quantization. So you'll see there it lights up Q to let you know it's in quantized record mode. So all of the quantization is done before recording, which is great because it means that it's quite versatile. And obviously you can go through and quantize after the fact as well, but this way you can set it to free mode. So if you want to record stuff Jay Dilla style, super loose, super out of the beat, you can set it to free mode, record that, switch back to quantize and get those snare drums really tight and the hi-hats maybe a bit looser, you know, your bass a bit loose, uh, and switch between those two. And then let's say, you know, you fuck something up in time. Can I say that? Fuck something up in timing. <laughs> you go to timing correct, and then you can select the specific pad that you want to quantize. So you can either do that paused and quantize the whole recording, or as it's playing, select specific notes in that section to quantize. So then it's quite versatile in that regard. And then of course, you will have noticed as I press play, it sequences through that pattern, uh, stepping up on that seven segment display. Um, so using plus minus, you can step through those steps. And obviously depending on the timing setting, the number of steps changes, allowing you to step sequence in a really precise manner. Uh, so, you know, you can insert specific rhythm using that you know, step sequencing function, or if you're a step sequencing head, you can go through and specifically sequence those, those steps. Um, so that's kind of how the recording works in the device. You get what are called scenes, 99 of those, nine projects, uh, and obviously each of those projects holds 99 scenes. So scene is where you can arrange something in the device. You can commit it, which is shift main, so that button there, uh, commit. And that will save what you've done, duplicate it, and then allow you to build on top of it as a scene. So let's say I've recorded that. I want to commit it to another scene. So now we've got scene two. Uh, I can record a bass sound. Terrible pattern, but. So you can record that, create another scene again, record some sort of melody sound. Let's have a look. Maybe I need to populate a pad there. Or perhaps it's just too, too quiet to hear it through the, the line in, but that's quite all right. I'll just press that and assume that you guys can hear it. Oh. Oh, I'm not getting, any, getting anything there. Ah, I got it. There we go. So if I select a melodic sound, or any sound in particular on the device and hit keys, that will transpose it across a scale on the device. You can change that scale by going shift erase. It takes you into the system settings. You know, go to scale. And then you can choose between, I think it's 12 different scales. I like to just use minor because I'm basic. But uh, you know, if you're a Lydian, Mixolydian, Locrian kind of person, you can go, go can down that route. Can you do uh, user scales? Is there like a um, Not currently, no. Um, but if it's something that people want, we could probably look into that in a software update. Um, we've got a lot of ideas for what the KO2 can do. This is just the start, you know. Um, we wanted to have a few of the key features at, at launch, but we've got quite a lot planned for it. Um, it's, it really is a platform for us, and we're quite excited to build on that platform. Um, so here I've got it set to minor. 
Are you, as it's a platform, are you thinking about other kind of devices within the same platform as well? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the EP series, right? So if you look on the back of the device, I think it says, EP series. So I can't give any details, of course. Of course, yeah. Um, but there will be more to come, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, got the, the scale set to minor. So if I want to, to record something in there, you can just go, uh, I think we've set it to scene three now. So just to put it back on track, uh, we created a new scene, recorded the bass, created another new scene, and now we're going to record some melodies. Terrible, terrible pattern. Terrible. <laughs> you guys can definitely do better than me in this But you regard, get the but, idea, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. It'll give you an idea. So now if I switch between the scenes, scene one will have just the drums, scene two will have the bass and the drums, and then scene three will have bass, drums, melody. So then when you're performing the beat, you can step between those scenes. So is it instantly step, it instantly switches, right? Yeah, so you can choose between instant or after a bar. So if, again, if I go into system, this is where you can sort of customize the behavior of the device. Uh, so if you go to sequence, SEQ, and then switch to scene, SCN. You can change it from tick, which is instantaneous, to bar, and then bar will change at the end of a bar. So that's maybe something that is a little bit harder to find, but if you're looking to, to change it after a bar, you can do that. It's just in the system settings. We set it by default to be instantaneous switch, just so that when you're having those ideas, you can quickly create stuff, kind of layer things up, create new scenes, start from scratch, and just switch between them. Um, and that'll help you, you know, like quickly build something up and figure out how you want things to go, as opposed to having to wait for it to switch each time. But then, of course, if you're performing it, then bar is more useful. Um, so cool, so should we have a look at the effects? Yeah, that's let's do fun. it. So uh, here, I'll do, maybe the drums are a bit more fun to piss about with the effects on. So if I hit effects, that'll take us into the effects. Uh, the fader will then control how much that effect is applied, so it's a dry, wet mix. Uh, so here, if I set it to delay, you can turn up feedback on the Y knob and length, so the space between impulses on the X knob. It gets quite resonant and funky at the, the higher feedbacks and the shorter lengths. It's quite a funky, uh, quite a funky delay. I quite like that one. Uh, the reverb is then quite, quite lush. Again, you've got length, but this time you've got color, a bit more relevant for a, a reverb. Uh, then you've got distortion. So it's quite a punchy, saturated distortion. Here you've got drive and you've got color. So that's the distortion. Uh, you've then got a chorus which is maybe not great on drums, but I can show you some of the, the feedback stuff on that. So again, like the delay, if you turn that feedback up, turn the modulation up. It gets quite uh, funky and crazy, but then of course you can turn that feedback down, turn the modulation down, and then you just get a quite subtle chorus effect. Um, then you've got a filter. This is great for if you're performing uh, and you want to, you know, you can turn it up to a certain amount on each group and then filter that, that uh, master filter, so to speak. Um, and then, of course, you can use the fader as well to control one of 12 different assignments, which can all be recorded um, into the, the sequence. Uh, so you've got, you know, level, which is the volume of the group, pitch, bend, uh, time stretch, low pass filter, high pass filter, FX send, attack, release, pan, uh, tune, which is like a 12 semitone stepped uh, pitch up or down, velocity, and modulation. And so you can record those using the fader, uh, and that's for the whole group. But then let's say you wanted to, to change it for all four groups, you can send them all to the filter and then turn that down. That's kind of the, 
the thinking there. Uh, then you've got a compressor, super tight. There's also one on the master bus, so you could actually double compress it if you were so inclined. Um. So, uh, you know, if you turn that down and you want something more subtle, then of course it can just compress it, but I quite like turning it way up and getting crazy with it. Uh, it's really great for when you're performing and you want to get that really punchy sound through the speakers. Um, so that's a bit about the effects. Uh, they apply per group. So it's one master effect, so to speak, that you send to on each group. Um, so the way that I usually like to use it myself when I'm composing is I'll send to the reverb because that sort of lushes out what you've recorded. Um, but then, you know, maybe if I'm performing live, I'll go for the distortion or the compression. Um, really nice effects to just like add some punch, all in device. And actually, if you plug something in through the line in, you can route it through that internal effect uh, and get, get crazy. So um, obviously, there has been a bit of a furor. Is that the right word? I don't know if that is. The, uh, the internet nonsense about the uh, fader. Yeah. Um, but that seems to be uh, kind of it's a shipping issue, right? And it's now yeah. kind of sorted. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it kind of came down to the fact that uh, we have really beautiful Shipped packaging in this tiny little for, box, right? <laughs> for, for the product, and uh, you know, I think um, essentially until you go out to ship something in mass volumes, it's very hard to predict how the packaging is going to behave. Um, and so we we learned from our mistake. We fixed it in future units, um, and I can tell you, every single unit in the factory is tested for every single function. So we test the fader. It's all robotically tested. We've actually got an article about it, I think on iFixit, that came out this week that goes into a little bit more detail. You can see the factory in Barcelona, um, some really amazing robots that test these things. Um, so everything's function tested beforehand. Um, and it was just the case that the box was a little bit too flimsy. And in some circumstances, if it was mishandled by couriers or whatever, then it, it could have got damaged in transit. Uh, but of course, if anyone gets a unit that has an issue, they can reach out to us and we'll replace it. Of course, um, yeah. We've got a really fantastic team of uh, customer support people that are on it uh, and happy to help out. So, you know, feel free to reach out if you've got any questions. If you've got any issues, you know, just send us an email and we're happy to, to look into it. Um, it's a very, very small number of units that have had the problem. Um, but of course, you know, none of them should have the issue. Uh, but we have looked into it, we've addressed it, and it's fixed going forward. Brilliant. Um, there was one other thing, which is the new color on the speaker, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so this is our OB4 speaker. Uh, it's a pretty sweet portable speaker. Uh, you really have to hear it to believe it. Yeah, I'm um, sure the NAM environment is not yeah, quite of the course. right. Um, but it's sort of like a portable PA system. I mean, it looks small, but it packs a punch. So it, it gets about 90 to 100 decibels at one meter just from the speaker at max volume. So, you know, it can come up against a PA system. I've done a gig where I was there showing it off uh, and there was a DJ right next to me with his massive PA system, me with my little OB4, and uh, I actually managed to get it louder than his PA system, which shocked him, you know. He had it loud, I turned it up, he turned it up, I turned it up, he turned it up, I turned it up, and he couldn't go any louder. So, uh, you know, for when you're in the field or even at home, want to listen to some music or, you know, going to a party, it's a, a great speaker to bring along with you. And it's quite gorgeous in the white that we've got coming. Uh, we've also got it available in the colors of the OP1 field. So that's uh, blue, okra, gray, and orange, uh, as well as the classic black and red colors that were available previously. Um, so this guy's probably going to come sometime later this year. Uh, it's really, really slick. Stormtrooper, black and white, you know. Uh, super so, excited. So uh, I forgot to ask about the price on the uh, sure. KO2, but also, I guess, the price on the speaker too. Yeah. So the KO2 runs at 299. Uh, it's 349 in some territories, but I believe in the UK and the US it's 299, Europe 239, uh, 249, uh, 349. Sorry, my bad. Uh, and then the speaker is around about 600 bucks, uh, pounds, euros. It depends on the model that you get. So the glossy ones are slightly more expensive because of the manufacturing. Uh, and the matte one, which is the black, is slightly cheaper. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's the kind of idea. We, we wanted it to be super accessible with the KO2. Um, we tried to look at the top and bottom. 
So we do stuff that's super cheap or super expensive, and the reasoning behind that is that the expensive stuff allows us to try things out, figure out what we want to do, experiment with new things, let our engineers go crazy, learn, that's the key thing, is learn, uh, and then apply it to that lower range. Um, so that then when we do something super affordable, it is the best in that category, the cheapest in that category, and you know, like really pull out as much as we can from that product. Um, so that's kind of the ethos at Teenage, is that we don't want to sit in the middle and do stuff that's sort of half-assed. We want to do amazing stuff at the top and amazing stuff at the bottom, and that's where we want to sit. So that's why we do KO2, and that's why we do OP1 Field. Brilliant. Well, Will, thank you very much for speaking to us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, have a good show. Cheers. Yeah, you too.